All right, it's showtime. Starting out part two tonight, my second uh, presentation of the night. And for those of you who weren't a part of part one, uh, this is my, uh, these are illustrations here of uh, different pilgrims uh, crossing over uh, uh, Europe, going to Santiago in Spain. And I showed you a lot of maps all over Britain and France and, and the like. And just talking about the, uh, the the medieval pilgrim experience, how that relates to the Millennial Kingdom. Uh, please go back, watch that, because I won't be repeating that information here. What I wanted to cover specifically was labyrinths, seeking the kingdom of heaven within. Yes, labyrinths are your friend. Of course, I'll be talking about this specific labyrinth here. Uh, mostly, this is the most probably popular labyrinth in the world, and it can be found in France. For everyone just now uh, joining me tonight, welcome. Glad you could be here. So Labyrinths by Noel Joshua Hadley. You can see that it was just uh, written, uh, finished less than a week ago. Among the many available paths leading its traveler deeper into the healing mysteries of heaven's kingdom, the labyrinth at uh, Chart Chartres in France stands out as a trophy from the rest. And that's the one I just showed you. That is why we are here. Get ready to discuss. The coffee is the coffee in my mug is piping hot. <laughs> it was when I wrote this. I'm drinking tea right now and it's kind of getting cold. Now, in a recent paper, Night Moves, I discussed the lost dance of the Millennial Kingdom, a carol which expressed a symbiotic heaven on earth pilgrimage experience between the immortal and the mortal the angel holding hands with the lady and the artisan and the knight, really people of all social classes. Of course, it's immediate follow-up, Mystery of the Maypole, made the connection between the cyclical solstices, the zodiac, and the carol, indicating that it too was a visual tool for the pilgrimage, given the proper season. My very next and most recent paper, a presentation I just concluded five minutes ago, The Pilgrim's Path, highlighted the actual routes of Millennial Kingdom travelers, the destination being the body of Mashiach. That is renewed Yerushalayim, uh, renewed Yerushalayim upon the earth, or renewed Jerusalem if you prefer. Though I'm sure Jerusalem in the desert was a popular destination too. Initially, the thought process was to include a section on the labyrinth in my Pilgrim's Path report, being that the labyrinth was intended as a companion to the pilgrim's healing and enlightenment. Not that I need to explain any of this to you. I just thought you'd like to know my thought process, where I've been, what I've been up to uh, over the last so many weeks of my life, and how I decided the labyrinth might do better on its own. Give it, uh, give its hedges room to grow. Allow the pilgrim his own walking space, that sort of thing. Just so long as we never forget the entryway an axis mundi of kingdom citizenship, which is renewed Yerushalayim. Now over here you can see a medieval illustration of a labyrinth. And then over here is a picture of a maze, which is a completely different thing. Mazes and labyrinths are confused all the time, as though we are dealing with identical twins, when clearly they are fraternal. Using the two words interchangeably is a rookie mistake. Don't do that. The defining difference is that a maze is, de is designed by a demurge-like architect in hopes of making you lose your way. A maze delivers disorienting turns of deceit as well as unforeseen dead ends with all the familiar snares of a hamster wheel in the rat race, kind of like the American dream or slave society in general. Most will be incapable of retracing their steps. Sounds like hell. A labyrinth, on the other hand, is a place you would enter to find yourself. Glory, hallelujah. Quite unlike mazes, they're uh, unicursally designed with twists and turns. Unicursal is the same thing as referring to a, um, a, a Eulerian path, a sequential set of edges within a graph that reach all nodes. That is to say, there is only one path leading to the center. All right, there's never two, there's never three, there's never, uh, uh, 
forks in the road or turns off, uh, you know, anything like that. Just one road, it twists around until you reach the end, and then you can retrace your steps. And so here we are. Rather than getting lost in the weeds, we are finding ourselves. Bonjour. All right, so this is the uh, the actual ca uh, cathedral. Hold on. Um, sorry. Here's the actual cathedral here. Uh, it's pronounced uh, Chartres. And uh, the outside, there's the uh, labyrinth inside. It looks like the uh, the group of uh, old ladies there have have made their way in, and now they're stopping to gaze up at just the ceiling and the pillars and just everything. You can see the uh, huge, massive rose window there. On the surface, a labyrinth would seem somewhat juvenile in nature. An elementary activity intended for pimply-faced milk drinkers with cream stashes. The pilgrim is expected to walk on a snaking path to the center without tripping or falling, turn around, and then walk back out again. And who in their right mind would want to do that? Boring. But then you have to, but then you, uh, then you, have you, I'm sorry, but then have you seen the floor design at Chartres in France? Imagine standing under that vaulted ceiling with its mighty stone pillars, rose windows, and viscous, uh, piscous designs, and then tell me again how simple-minded its architects were. Every single feature of the cathedrals were designed exclusively for the spiritual rejuvenation of the soul. Uh, Chartres floor plan is no exception. Now, I'm sorry if I'm butchering my, my French words here. It's a bummer, actually. Uh, I was so close to that cathedral in France, I didn't know it existed. If, the next time I go to France, I'm totally going to walk this labyrinth. I will ask you to take another look at the labyrinth again from above. Tell me what you see. All right, so just take a quick look at it right here. You can pause the video if you need to. The quadrants make up the four quarters of the earth, though I'm also detecting a cross, which on closer inspection is just as likely a tav. There are 11 circuits counted from the outside to the center, with the middle making up the 12. Do I need to go over that number again? Smack dab in the center may very well resemble our axis mundi, though we all know what the Sunday school answer is, Jesus. I will accept your answer, but then raise to uh, raise it to include the sacred inner chamber which the bride of Mashiach longs for. In broader terms, I have no, uh, I have little, if any, doubt in my mind that we're once again dealing with the belly button of the world, renewed Yerushalayim. Okay, so right there in the center, and take a look at it, the the center again, and tell me what else you see in there. Notice the six petal rosette at its center. Whoops, the rosette can be found throughout nearly every ancient religion and was a staple of the mystery religions. Must be pagan then. Well, now that I've lost half of my audience, the rosette is known to represent the flowering and healing union of masculine and feminine energies. A total age of Pisces thing. Of course, the, the cathedrals were uh, built up for the same masculine feminine uh, union of energy as well. You had to have been there, I guess, the age of Pisces. The six petals are also said to be a representation of the six different kingdoms, mineral, plant, animal, human, angelic, and divine. And since we're on to the number six, its sacred meaning involves balance and cultivating communication to our problems so that we can find peace of mind, which is a perfect description of the labyrinth, if I do say so myself. In other words, the labyrinth at Chartres is a tool steeped in sacred geometry. And what is sacred geometry? Well, if you take a handful of ratios and create forms out of them, then they are sacred if they help the seeker to achieve their desired spiritual goal, which the labyrinth at Chartres does. It is a tool designed to foster contemplation, personal discipline, and above all else, spiritual transformation. Now, this is a... Uh, I might describe where this is, but you can see here is another labyrinth on the floor. A lot of these, unfortunately, most of the labyrinths, my understanding is that they did not survive and they were stripped and 
Uh, the floors were uh, relayed down, uh, but many of them have, oh, I'm sorry, some of them, few of them, like this one and the uh, and Chartres, have managed to keep the originals. Consider the scripture verses which might guide the prayers of the penitent pilgrim as he walks the path. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Yeshiyahu or Isaiah 30, 21. Here's another one. You make known to me the path of life. You will find me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Psalms 16, 10. Here's one from Proverbs 16, 9. In their hearts, humans plan their course, but Yahweh establishes their steps. And here's another, Yochanan 14, 6. Yahushua answered, I am the way and the truth in the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Here's another one from 2 Corinthians 5, 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. And I'll pause here. Uh, one of the big ideas of meditation in the uh, in the millennial kingdom or the middle, medieval ages was to, to actually read scripture out loud and to actually, when you read it out loud, to let it penetrate your entire body so that you're like, you're being washed with, with the word and, and you would memorize it as you do. You just keep repeating it and you memorize it over and over and over again. So you would have these, uh, these verses. I mean, you might have it in a book you're reading as you're going through the labyrinth. That's very likely. They might've had books like that, but you would just be quoting scripture that you have learned as you go through it. Stepping into a labyrinth involved the clearing of your mind, letting go, releasing earthly attachments, quieting, emptying, a process which begins at the entrance and ends at the center. Unlike the labyrinths of the ancient mystery religions, the labyrinth of the Middle Ages held a distinct Christian interpretation. They served as a representation and embodiment of the covenant members uh, arc from sin to redemption. Perhaps in the shedding of his own ego, the pilgrim might recite the following prayer. And so that was, that was in the, you know, you go in there to, you, you, you go in there to discover the divine in the sinner by shedding your ego. And of course, in the pagan mystery religions, the idea of releasing the ego to find the divine is the divine within. It's eating from the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Whereas in this, the divine is Yahushua HaMashiach, right? A Mashiach within us. We're not talking about Christ consciousness here. Our Father in heaven, or our Father in heaven, how will be your name? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Matthew 6, 9 through 10. Imagine reciting that in the millennial kingdom. Along the way, having opened your heart as a willing vessel, praying, asking questions, rehearsing scripture, listening, and narrowing your exclusive focus upon the existence of the divine, there is a spaciousness waiting to be discovered wherein the inside is larger than the outside world. In reaching the center of the labyrinth, the pilgrim has navigated a living symbol of the journey of faith one must take as a living sacrifice in a sinful, broken world, and has, y'all willing, found shalom. So by the time you get to the middle, the idea is to have complete shalom with, uh, with Al-Hayam, or God. But then it is in retracing one's steps from the sinner that resolution reaches its ultimate transformative power. The true pilgrimage is never about the destination, nor can it be exclusively found in the steps it takes to get there. The GPS coordinates to renewed Yerushalayim was, with, was within all along. So let's see what this says. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of Allah Hayam should come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of Allah Hayam cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, lo, here or lo, there. For behold, the kingdom of Allah Hayam is within you. Lucas, or the Gospel of Luke 17, 20 through 21. 
The first Christian labyrinth, we are told, was placed upon the floor in the Basilica of Rapparatus in Algeria around 324. And this is a, a picture of it here. It's the, the center of it really was awesome when I spent time looking at it. Well, whatever the reported year, 324 or whatever, it set the standard for labyrinths to come. Look at the floor plan, the Tav with its four swastika uh, quadrants. Yes, there, there, there's the Tav right there, uh, the cross in the center, and it comes out into like a, a swastika pattern. And tell me that is not renewed Yerushalayim in the center. Now, if you, if you remember the, the report I did on the hidden wilderness and the idea of the swastika with the, the Big Dipper and the North Star and how that, you know, is uh, kind of over hyperbore and all that. Supposing the pilgrim were to enjoy crossword puzzles, then he or she is in luck. The square provides only eight letters for deciphering purposes. How does, but how does one unscramble them? The solution can be found when one discovers the tav within the tav. So look to the very center of the puzzle, seven squares removed from the north, south, east, or western edges. Smack dab in our renewed, in our renewed Jerusalem, you'll find an S. Okay, so let's look at this right here. This is a, a blow up of the center. When you reach the center of this labyrinth and you have to decipher what does this say. So right here in the center is an S. From this S, you could fan out above in any direction. S-A up here, S-A-N over here, S-A-N. You can go, you can see the red letters here. They're just showing you. They just go in any crazy order. And they all spell the same thing. It's crazy uh, how this works. How it just fans out and it all spills the same message, as long as you could find the S in the middle. From there, it is a uh, palindrome of text. Move in any direction, backwards or forwards, up or down, and the word reads Sancta Ecclesia. One barely needs to read Latin to translate the meaning. The entire divine purpose of every soul explodes from the center and fills the entire earth. It is the body of Yahushua HaMashiach, his Holy Church. And of course, that's what uh, Sancta Ecclesia means, Holy Church. And I know a lot of you were thinking about this movie, uh, Labyrinth, so I'll be talking about this for the remainder of the night. Labyrinths and Labyrinth. It was in, it was the movie. <laughs> Let me say this again. It was the movie, wasn't it? That's what most of you were thinking when I thought to bring up The Labyrinth, the Jim Henson-directed Muppet movie, Labyrinth. I knew it. A lot of people forget that it was executive uh, produced by George Lucas when his name still meant something. I guess it's like that saying, you either die the hero, which Henson did, he died pretty young, or you live long enough to become the villain. Uh -huh, Lucas. Well, let's not get caught up in Hollywood productions when my every effort should be to compare or contrast the nightmare Muppet of a movie, Labyrinth, with the medieval worldview. They're not the same. Or are they? It's high time we found out. Jennifer Connelly, who played the prepubescent, really the pubescent, but the prepubescent Sarah in the movie, entered a labyrinth to retrieve her infant brother after the Goblin King, played by David Bowie, snatched the baby from its crib. Mind you, the kidnapping only happened after a day frolicking among the pointy little obelisks in the park, reciting esoteric verses. We then learn that her mother has run away to become an actress, thanks in part to the playbill in Sarah's room. In true fairy tale fashion, a stepmother has moved in to sweep away her father's devotion, leaving Sarah despondent with the physical world, a toxic recipe for teenagers, being despondent with the physical world. The infant child, whom she is tasked to babysit every weekend, every Friday night, is only a half-brother. He therefore serves as a literal embodiment of the void left behind by her mother's absence in light of her father's detachment. We're still only a few minutes into the movie when Sarah wishes out loud that the Goblin King would take her brother Toby away. That's the baby's name, Toby, if you wondered, which he does promptly and without hesitation. It's as if he were patiently waiting in the shadows of her mind all along. 
desiring an avatar by which he might manifest or perhaps her biological changes and you know biological meaning her body awakened him is he an external reality taking advantage of her development or a figment of her budding sexual imagination the intrusive cup in his trousers or perhaps it is an oversized pimple ready to pop you tell me would certainly suggest the later scenario at least in part that he's a uh, a figment of her budding sexual imagination. The fact that dozens of goblins hide in her closet, uh, Muppet goblins of all uh, goblins, waiting upon the proper incantation to be spoken may suggest that Sarah's external world never really changed, despite her change in perspective. It was Sarah that changed internally. In this scenario, the goblins were indeed the entities of her childhood imagination. They were there all along anticipating the long overdue changing of the guard. I'm reminded of a pivotal line dictated by Alice in Lewis Carroll's Alice, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Immediately after becoming disassociated from her own psyche when falling down the rabbit hole, she enters her own personal labyrinth of sorts, an underground world where she can never find the right key for its intended keyhole, and she is repeatedly... Uh, growing or shrinking, seemingly always the wrong size. In a tearful response, the young Alice, also becoming quite the woman uh, uh, biologically, quickly states, Dear, dear, how queer everything is today. And yesterday things went on just as usual. I wonder if I've been changed in the night. Let me think. Was I the same person when I got up this morning? I almost think I can remember feeling a little different. But if I'm not the same, the next question is, who in the world am I? Ah, that's the great puzzle. There is your clue to setting the topsy-turvy world of Wonderland upright upon its feet again, converting nonsense literature into something resembling critical logic. It is not the world which changed, but the other way around. Indeed, Alice was inhabiting Wonderland all along. And yes, Labyrinth has many allusions to Alice's journey. Labyrinth is a story involving a girl's awakening to womanhood with the actual labyrinth, which the young woman must enter serving as a manifestation of her subconsciousness. So you could, well, I'll, I'll say this for the ending. I guess I won't jump ahead of myself. Talk about the ins and outs, twists and turns, as well as the dead ends and the pitfalls involved in a man attempting to understand the mysteries of a woman's mind. The labyrinth of Henson lore looks an awful lot like a brain, does it not? It looks like a brain to me. I will quickly ask you to recall the state of the soul in Platonism. In Platonism, we must navigate a gauntlet of lies embodying the material world, searching for whatever truth is manifested without any knowledge of the world of forms from which we have fallen. I say Platonism, which is the scholarly answer. It is also misdirection when left on its own because Plato did not invent the Hellenistic ideas attributed to his name. And as I have, and neither did Socrates, and as I have shown in other places, pre-existence is totally legit. Many, if not all of you know what I mean when stating he is controlled opposition. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, but I digress. So don't throw platonic ideas out just because they're attributed to Plato. I mean, that's, that's controlled opposition. It's like, let's throw out the Bible because the Pope holds it and is, you know, he holds the Bible. Sarah's entry into her own subconsciousness harkens to Platonism just as assuredly as Greek mythology is involved. Upon entering her subconscious, one can easily envision the stories of old whereupon a demigod such as Theseus, son of uh, Poseidon, enters the labyrinth to battle the Minotaur, thereby freeing the Athenians. Though I would take it even further to uh, Persephone's rape by Hades, her cyclical death and resurrection tale in the uh, Illicinian Mysteries. And I used to talk about that a lot years ago. Because by all appearances, that is what Sarah's subconscious is a stand-in for here, the underworld. Taking the same deductive reasoning to the degree of the Gnostics, we are each inhabiting our own personal hell thanks largely to the uh, Sorcerer's Apprentice, a.k.a. the Demirge, which is why mastering our subconscious, thereby attaining personal gnosis, is the return, return entry point to heaven. And that's according to the Gnostics, not according to me. 
Puberty cannot be overstated in any analysis of Henson's movie. It is a coming of age tale in every sense of the word. Uh, Hoggle, and it's like everyone mispronounces his name in the movie. So if I mispronounce it, I don't feel bad. Hoggle, a troll like inhabitant of the labyrinth, the first whom she encounters is occupied holding his, <clears throat> his phallus, uh, going pee pee or tinkle into a pool when they meet. As if an introduction to her own subconsciousness were not vulgar enough, she is then appalled to learn that he receives further relief from spraying garden fairies, poisoning them as one might mosquitoes, almost sadistically. Remember those uh, killing puppies in the Millennial Kingdom? Or I should say in the Dark Ages from my last paper? Her disgust is only slightly pacified after one such fairy bites her on the hand uh, as an added assurance that all her preconceived notions from childhood were wrong. Fairies are awful creatures. They bite rather than bless. But then there are the obscene number of obelisks lining and leading the way through the labyrinth of her mind. Am I being too crass in suggesting male genitalia, specifically that we are gazing in upon a young woman's curiosity regarding penetration and pleasure, a gnosis intended for the bride's chamber? Did I mention that her father and stepmother were currently out on their weekly date, getting alone time? And in terms of overlooked details, recall once again the film's opening sequence. Sarah was spending her leisure hours among the obelisks while dressed in a virginal gown of white. Not overlooking the father-son avatar aspect of sun worship, as well as the mysteries of Isis, as well as Nimrod, which the phallus ultimately appears to derive from, mere intercourse would come across as an exoteric explanation. In both instances, Isis and Semiramis play an integral part in the ceremony. There are multiple layers to this. All right. Now, getting back to Sarah's rude awakening, uh, she encounters doors, which are not as they seem, passageways formerly unseen by the untrained eye, and one can never know which of the door knockers are telling lies or the truth. More sexual innuendos? Sarah's insistence to mark her path with arrows using lipstick, only to learn that the inhabitants were suppressing her every expectation by turning or inverting those stones, bolstered her confusion. At one point, Sarah chooses the wrong door, resulting in an unpleasant tumble into the unforeseen darkness, more of that Alice imagery for you. It is there in the pits of her indiscretion that she is manhandled by hundreds of helping hands. The bog of eternal stench, which she was threatened with but must eventually face, only enhances the formula. We are dealing with base desires. They're all mental processes of alchemical transformation. It is near the end of her journey of sexual awakening when she quite suddenly finds herself in a Venetian-inspired masquerade ball devilish masks around her, but then so do those with elongated penis-sized noses. Blink and you'll miss it. One of them is stroked by his partner. More than any other scene, the ballroom plays out as though Sarah is now being freighted into a pocket of consciousness rather than subconsciousness, a girl's fetish, if you will, because it is played off as a temptation. It is in Sarah's discovery that she is trapped behind a mirror. So at the, at this ball in this ballroom in this, uh, Venetian masquerade ball, uh, she finds herself trapped behind a mirror. Another allusion to Alice is the mirror in actuality, a crystal ball. At any rate, she breaks through it, entering from one world to another, like a split psyche or psyche. I'm beginning to detect the MK ultra program. In fact, the goblin, uh, the goblin King straight up comes across as her groomer. Had this been an actual ball, um, and by that I mean a Hollywood elite sex orgy, we would be asking the question how many of the other women were groomed into wearing the devil mask. Mind you, this was the 1980s. He kidnapped a baby during the heightened tension of the satanic panic with its thousands of missing milk carts and children, but that is just a side note. A groomer will um, ingratiate themselves with their victim and eventually isolate them socially and physically. This continued behavior will persist in such a way that he maintains total control over his said victim. 
As the narrative runs its course, we learn that the Goblin King's entire world uh, revolves around Sarah. She is the very reason as to why he exists. Everything he did, he did for her. Never is his role as her MK Ultra handler more evident than when she recites another incantation, one which declares he has no control over her. Defeating her handler is the greatest illusion of all. Her ultimate conquest was an intended part of the psychodrama. Supposing he has been successful in splitting the psyche, then he has won. As ultimate evidence of this, Sarah can now look into her bedroom mirror and conjure the Muppets of her once self-consciousness, I should say subconsciousness, typo, <coughs> excuse me, manifesting them as another embodiment of her own person. I used to talk about psychodramas a lot back in the day. Uh, I haven't in a while, so a lot of the newer viewers might not even know what I'm talking about there. But uh, psychodrama is, is, as I say, real magic. It's, it's uh, COVID, for example, was a psychodramatic episode in which everybody was tasked to live out their part and survive this terrible thing that was happening Hence the drama, the, the psychodramatic. And by coming out the other end and surviving and just conquering their uh, controllers, so to speak, uh, they uh, they were alchemically transformed. And, and just think about how much humanity has been transformed since 2019. It's, it's, it's quite sad. Humanity has definitely changed in, in, my, in my years. The question I wanted to answer in all of this was whether or not the Muppet movie might be better described as a maze or if it in any way resembles the medieval labyrinth. I suppose it all comes down to the individual the perspective. Allow me to explain with the classic example of a minotaur. Actually, it is beyond fascinating to see centaurs inhabiting the, dis, uh, the deepest crevice of the Christian labyrinth. So here's an uh, illustration from the medieval uh, period. And you can see there they're capturing centaurs in the background. It looks like one centaur killed the guy. So these are wild dudes. You see a skull there. They keep going back there and capturing the centaurs and then moving them into the labyrinth. And then the knight enters through these two, this entrance here through the two ladies. He gets the center, slays it. And you get this idea that this knight over here in this corner walking up the two ladies had already uh, defeated a, um, a centaur. The centaur is a perfectly compatible stand-in for the minotaur. Like the Goblin King, his presence symbolizes our deepest fears and base desires lurking in the shadowy labyrinth of our subconscious. To quote from Paul in Romans 7.15, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. Sounds like Paul has a minotaur, maybe even a centaur on the loose. In either case, Making them a man-beast hybrid emphasizes our complex nature as individuals, a mixture of animalistic desires and godlike aspirations. As part of the chivalry process, knights are shown entering to defeat the centaur one by one. They must first pass through the two women there to greet them, resembling something akin to the two pillars of Freemasonry. They would therefore symbolize stability and wisdom, strength and beauty, light and darkness, Luke and Leia, the sun and the moon. By the looks of the one knight walking off with the two ladies, as I've shown you, I'm guessing they were his greeters, though now he has won their love, telling us that the ultimate aim of chivalry, the divine reunion with the tree of life, has been achieved. So yes, I guess I would be in support of the Labyrinth movie resembling its medieval counterpart, even though it is completely inverted like the mystery religions which sponsor it involving the transformation which can be found in the alchemical based psychodrama and the minotaur centaur is one is the one pulling the strings regarding the stark contrast of the medieval lib, uh, labyrinth i will i will feel the urge to quote paul in romans again and he says this in the same way count yourselves dead to sin but alive to al hayam and yahusha hamashiach therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. And that comes from Romans 6, 11 through 12. The Christian labyrinth was a tool in the salvation process intended to transform the pilgrim from a corpse into a new creation, transforming his prayer from a fleshly 
to a spiritual desire. It was the kingdom of heaven upon the earth and his citizenship in renewed Yerushalayim that he was after. Um, all right. So hopefully you guys, you know, enjoyed that and hopefully it was informative. And um, I broke that up into two parts just because I didn't want the labyrinth part to be buried at the end of the pilgrimage presentation, though they are both interconnected. And um, if anyone has any questions, I'll go ahead and answer them. But it looks like a lot of you were just greeting each other and saying hi and shalom. So um, I won't take any more of your time. I'll have, uh, I think this Thursday I'm giving an interview. Um, Friday I will have my Torah portions. We're going through Leviticus. Next Tuesday I'm going to be uh, having another Malayo Kingdom presentation. And I promise I, I have uh, Paul in Galatians, the Galatian study, to continue I have not forsaken that. It's just going to be slow getting through it. I intend to give that next Tuesday too. So shalom, everybody. I'll see you guys in a couple days um, to end the week.